Well, thank you very much, Peter, for uh, both that introduction and for inviting me to talk here. It's uh, really a pleasure. Um, and to talk about something that I'm new to in many ways, I've only been working in agriculture robotics for about five years now, but uh, I just have a real passion for it. And uh, it's, it's one that's been very exciting to see a lot of the energy and enthusiasm coming uh, towards this field. Um, Peter mentioned this, and I think I, I'll just really quickly say, yeah, we, we were very excited uh, last September. Uh, Blue River, which is a small startup company in Silicon Valley, was acquired by John Deere, which is this massive global company. Um, and it's just been this amazing experience. Uh, you know, big company, but very forward-looking, uh, very excited about the technology. And so I think there's just a ton of opportunity that I see, both for us personally, but, but also just in the broader community. Um, I realized as I was thinking about it, the, the title of Big Machines Caring for Little Plants probably is a nice metaphor somehow for John Deere is this massive machine that's, you know, running forward and we're kind of the little dandelion that they're taking care of. Uh, hopefully not trying to weed out. <laughs> no, I think they're, they're, they're really excited and, and I think, like I said, very forward thinking um, and it's just, I, I, there's so many problems and I'll, I'll reference some of that towards the end of this talk about uh, how we're going to leverage some of their scale and, and, and uh, the problems that they've got. Um, I also will mention, I, I uh, was debating whether to talk about kind of the startup experience in this. Uh, I decided not to, but if anyone wants to talk about that, I've, I've gone through this a couple cycles now of, of kind of working with startup, getting acquired. Uh, it's quite a ride, and uh, I definitely have enjoyed it, but uh, if anyone is interested in talking through that, I'm happy to do that after the talk. Um, Peter mentioned, I mean, obviously, agriculture and food, uh, it's something that touches us every single day, and so there's no getting around that. It's going to be here for a long time, uh, and there are many challenges in this area, and I'm not probably the ideal person to set the stage on this, but let me just motivate it a little bit in terms of working in this field. Um, there's, there's lots of studies that, that you've, we've seen recently in talking about the, the problems with scaling production of agriculture. And so this is a major area that is, at the end of the day, going to affect the planet, going to affect all of us, uh, with increasing populations, with uh, fairly limited new land that we can use for agriculture. Uh, we've got to come up with new ways to produce food. There's estimates that I've seen that sound crazy, but over the next 30 years, we need to double food production, which is just a massive scale if we really have to do that. Um, no matter what, though, there's going to be this need to increase food production, do it in a scalable and, and sustainable way. Um, and I think some of the challenges are also uh, kind of amplified by uh, labor shortages. Uh, the, the farm community is an aging population. It's getting older and older, the average age, uh, as well as issues, especially in the U.S., where I come from, the, the immigration laws that have become tougher and tighter and tighter uh, ha have made labor a real challenge. Um, and then there's this added twist for the farmers that I'm going to talk about a lot today is the issue of herbicide-resistant weeds. So not only do you have to deal with kind of getting the, the plants out of the ground and getting them to germinate and making sure you fertilize them well, but now you've got these weeds that they just don't have good mechanisms for, to kill. Uh, and so we're developing different ways to tackle that problem. Um, and lastly, I think kind of on, on the positive side, there's a trend towards greener agricultural practices, organic practices, uh, more sustainable practices, especially when related to the, new, the, uh, the um, inputs that we apply, like water, fertilizer, herbicides. Um, so trying to do that in a more efficient and, and again, sustainable way. Uh, and that's a lot of where we focused. Um, I think another exciting piece of all of this is that I would argue we're kind of entering this new era of agriculture. Um, so, you know, for, for only about 100 years, we've been doing things that haven't just been manually plowing the land, uh, you know, using, using, for example, a horse. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's uh, almost 100 years ago today that John Deere introduced the tractor to um, scaling out uh, and commercializing the tractor for, for commercial use. Uh, and so that obviously increased production, and that was a great kind of um, achievement. Uh, and then 50, 60 years ago, you started to see introduction of new chemicals, uh, both in, in fertilizer that could be mass produced, as well as herbicides that could target and kill plants. Um, and that again gave you kind of this boost in production and, and um, the ability to, to, to grow, uh, grow farms, grow, grow the scale of farms uh, out. Uh, and then more recently, in the last 20, 30 years, uh, there's been these, what we'll call biochemical, but essentially bioengineered traits, um, so GMO traits that are paired with things like Roundup, you may have heard of, uh, you know, the, the things that people either love or hate, but uh, have allowed us to, again, scale, scale production. Um, 
And so those gave a kind of a new twist that, that allowed us to unlock even more productivity, um, but with some definite downfalls. And I'll get to that also about the herbicide resistance. Um, but now we've got this, uh, what, what's really kind of kicked off as a part of precision agriculture where I've got the ability to know kind of where everything is and a lot of precision agriculture is just about knowing that, having good GPS signals and, and um, understanding where things are. But you couple that with the ability to upload data and collect data from all these different places and analyze data with relatively cheap processing and new sensors like cameras getting out in the field. Uh, and you've got this nice confluence of the digital components that are starting to bring agriculture to a new, a new space. And uh, that's certainly kind of where we're uh, trying to, to um, have, a, have an impact and, and change a little bit the way agriculture is done and perceived. Um, so I'll, I'll dive into all of that. Um, before I jump into it, I thought I should just at least kind of give a shout out to, there, there's a lot of things going on in the robotics side that I think are interesting. Um, and I, I kind of broadly categorize into four places. I apologize if I left somebody off. Uh, you know, this is mostly just some of the things that have struck my attention, you know, caught my attention. Um, but a lot of interesting work in structured environments, so we have to adapt the environment to the machinery. Um, we've kind of stayed away from that, but, but there's a lot of progress, progress to be made. We've tried to go in and say, I don't want the farmer to have to modify anything. We want to just go in and, and take, the, take the way things work. Um, some really cool stuff in, in autonomous vehicles and, and porting some of the ideas that have been developed in the robotics community over the years into agriculture and, and how to get machines going through the fields. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about more, more about that later. Uh, obviously drones has been a huge area, uh, a lot centered around data collection, but even some action, things like spraying. Uh, and then harvesting, uh, if you haven't seen the YouTube video of Abundant Robotics, it's a super cool little apple suction picker that uh, goes through and picks apples off the trees. Uh, so there's some cool stuff there. Harvesting is still one of the hardest, I think, agricultural problems. Uh, anything with manipulation is still, I think, a little bit beyond what we can commercialize. Uh, so I, I wish the best for Abundant Robots, but they've picked a really hard problem. Um, so anyway, uh, again, just you know, kind of a brief mention of some of the other things going on in agricultural robotics, and I think it's just a cool time to be in this space, uh, both because the technology is uh, coming up with really fascinating and kind of novel ways to approach the problem, uh, but also because uh, it's just a, a something that you can have a lot of impact uh, just by, by pursuing some of these challenges. Um, so let's talk about uh, the big machines part of this. Um, I mentioned kind of these different stages of improving productivity uh, and one of the ways in which that has, has kind of transpired is having these wider machines that are spraying these chemicals over the entire field. You know, just basically treat every plant the same. I spray the same amount of chemical and try and just douse it with a uh, herbicide that the plants are tolerant to. So I just go out and spray the same herbicide like Roundup um, over the field. It kills the weeds and uh, I'm able to do this very quickly and efficiently. Everything's great, right? So uh, that would be the ideal story. Uh, the reality is that pretty soon you start to have plants that de de develop and e evolve to have uh, resistance to these herbicides. And so you see it in a limited extent over 20 years ago. Uh, you can see the, the <coughs> map as it goes through, it gets worse and worse uh, to the point where even just a few years ago there's tens of millions of acres in the U.S. that have these herbicide resistant weeds. So you do this thing where I apply this big broad acre coverage and the weeds don't die. Uh, and so what happens when a weed doesn't die is it's, it, it plants itself and, and spreads seeds for the next year and it gums up the machines when you try and go to harvest. Uh, and it fights out the resources for the plants. So it's just bad for, for any type of productivity for, uh, for your yields. Um, and no real good solutions for this. So at this point, it's this chemical warfare. It takes over 10 years to develop a new chemical uh, to get it released into the market. And we've seen the introduction of one new chemical in the last, I, I don't know the, exactly when it came out, but it was roughly five to 10 years. So it's, it's a losing arms race to try and just solve this chemical. So what we want to do is take kind of this big machine um, that is treating everything the same and change the focus down to the plant level. So we want to treat these plants at an individual level. And again, use components from robotics that allow us to do that. It's, it's being able to see the plants, it's being able to act on the plants, it's being able to do this accurately uh, and at high speed. 
So in our case, this is what our big machine looks like. Um, this is a, uh, in this case, this is our very first uh, eight row weaving machine. Uh, so it does eight rows. It's, it's roughly, um, uh, it's about an eight meter wide machine, uh, weighs a little over uh, 4,000 4, kilos. <laughs> so it's, it's not, a, not, not a lightweight. Um, it gets pulled through the field by a tractor. And uh, again, I'll, I'll describe some more of what it does. And this is our plants that we're trying to grow for. So uh, th this is an example of soybeans. Uh, you can kind of see the row line of the soybeans kind of going up and to the left. Uh, and this is our arch nemesis. This is the culprit of, uh, that, that kind of drives the, drives the story of why we need to care for these plants. Uh, this is called Palmer amaranth or pigweed. Um, a single one of these plants will grow up and disperse on the order of 500,000 seeds across the field. Um, so it's just a nasty predator, if you will. Um, it, it's a pest. Um, and so our, our goal is to be able to identify those plants and deliver a herbicide that can take them out without damaging the crop. And again, I'll, I'll dive into more of this. Um, this is what it looks like when you're not effective at doing that. Uh, I don't know if it looks horrible, but uh, to a farmer, this is just a disaster. This, this field on the left probably just gets tilled and destroyed. There's just no, no hope in, in being able to harvest it. Um, again, this is a combination of different types of weeds, but in, in particular, this pigweed is the one that's uh, really ruining the fields. Um, so that's our goal, is to, to eliminate that weed and, and control it. So this is kind of a graphical description of what our system looks like, and I just want to walk you through it, and I'll show you a video of it in action in just a second. But it's basically a, a system that has four main components. It's got a camera that's kind of out ahead of this module, and we dedicate one of these modules for every row of uh, soybeans or cotton, the big crops that we're working on, row crops. Um, a camera out looking in front to decide what plants are there and classify between the weeds and the crop so that we can make decisions. It's got a processing module, obviously, that's doing all that real-time processing right on board, right local to the camera. Uh, we're using the NVIDIA Jetson for that, which has worked great. Uh, it's got a bank of sprayers, and these sprayers are laid out across the row in such a way that I have roughly about a five centimeter block for every spray that I can control. So if you can think about this, I'm going through and I'm spraying just essentially a dot matrix pattern of sprays with roughly a, a four to five centimeter resolution. Uh, and I'm doing that in real time. So running it, our machines are running somewhere around 10 kilometers per hour, um, actually going up to probably 15. Uh, and then one thing I do want to call out, because I'll come back again and mention this, is uh, we have a rear camera system. So we have a secondary camera that's actually going there and looking at the spray ground to see, hey, did we do this right? Did we, did we get the action correct? And that's been really critical, and I'll, I'll come back and hammer on that, because I think of all the things that I've learned as we've gone, that's been maybe the most painful lesson, but also a really valuable lesson to learn is having this kind of evaluation tool, something to learn from the system as we go. Um, this is just an example of, of what that whole process looks like. So on the left, you see a series of stitched images. These are uh, probably a series of six or eight images that have been stitched together uh, of the individual plants. Um, you can, again, pick out a row of cotton in this case, and the weeds kind of scattered off into the side. The center picture shows you what this looks like as we've identified the plants. So green boxes showing the crop, the ones that we want to keep, and red boxes showing the weeds that we want to kill. Um, each one being identified with a certain level of confidence, and, uh, and um, so we're going to use that information to decide where to spray and which ones to kill. Uh, we're using deep, deep learning network, deep neural network, for, um, for being able to do this classification. Um, that's, again, one that, that we've had a lot of experience with using kind of classically hand-tuned features, but the deep networks just perform so well that there's just no denying that it's a great path to, to use in this type of system. Um, and then the right side shows you kind of what the sprays look like. So this is, again, from that secondary camera that's capturing images and being able to decide, okay, which, which plants did I spray and did I get it correct? Uh, and you can see kind of the little dark patches around the weeds, which is where we've sprayed. Uh, again, going down to something like a, a, a two centimeter, uh, sorry, excuse me, a five centimeter re resolution on the sprays uh, and being able to do this at, at high speeds. And then this is... Uh, kind of one of my favorite pictures I've had from the field. Uh, just it, it shows you kind of how gnarly these problems can be. Uh, there's kind of a cotton crop in the middle of that <laughs> that we've identified, actually. And you can see the dark spray around it, which is where we sprayed. 
So we're trying to save that cotton plant by killing it without, without killing it and, and kill the weed around it. Um, now that's, that's a pretty extreme example, but in, in every field we're seeing things like this. Uh, and so that's the challenge, is to be able to identify uh, plants touching each other with overlap, um, being able to spray in very tight quarters and, and have those results. Uh, this is a video that I just wanted to skip over. So this shows you kind of an overhead view of the, of the system. This is looking straight down uh, just behind the sprayers. And I'll, I'll play this through a couple times because it goes pretty quickly. Um, and then I'll show you, this will have a slow motion version. So there's a crop, line of crop there. There's a weed in the foreground here. Um, here's the slow motion version as it drives by. Um, and you can see what we're, we're basically doing. We have a camera looking down, identifying all the crop, identifying this weed. This bank of sprayers is under this white kind of shrouded area. And it's going to spray, lay down a spray just over the plants. And do that day in, day out. Um, we are operate on something like 100 to 200 acres a day. Um, at, again, you know, 10 to 15 kilometers per hour. Uh, let's see if I can get it to play one more time. Oops. Yeah, uh, again, that overhead view, um, just so you can kind of see roughly what the machine looks like. Um, and then the sprays as they go. And you can see kind of the different patterns laid down um, by the sprayer. And I think that the slow motion one's always nice. You can see there's a lot of motion in the crops. Um, fortunately, it's not so significant in the, for the speeds we're moving at. Uh, we're able to, to handle that type of motion. We use the shrouded system. You can see kind of there's this overall shroud just to diffuse the light, but also to deflect the wind. Uh, we're operating in fields that very often will have on the order of uh, 20 and 30, mile, 30 kilometer per hour winds. Uh, so we need to be able to spray very accurately. Our, our sprays obviously need to get down to that um, probably three to five centimeter accuracy level. And so what's really nice about this is you end up not spraying the entire field. You end up spraying this very small portion of the field. In fact, what we found is in most cases, the weeds only occupy somewhere around 5 to 10% of the field. Uh, so you've taken this system that was spraying entire fields and draw, dropped it down to where you use about 90% less herbicide. So you really dramatically reduce the amount of herbicide that gets used. Um, this also allows you to spray different types of chemicals. So in the past where you were locked into the set of chemicals that you could only spray on the crop because it wouldn't damage the crop, but it also more or less wasn't damaging the weeds. Uh, now you can spray different chemicals that will kill anything. Um, they're not paired with the crop, but you're not spraying on the crop anymore. So you've got this ability to unlock a whole new toolkit for controlling weeds. Um, and then there's, it's always surprising to me, but uh, you know, the, this pairing of chemicals and seeds is really expensive to the farmer. The, the folks like Monsanto charge a lot of money just for those genetically modified traits. And so when you get away from having to pair those up, you unlock another whole bunch of savings there. Uh, so it's, it's been pretty exciting to see all the potential for this type of application. And farmers just embrace it completely. Um, we're in the stage right now where we've, we've I, I probably should mention this earlier, we've, we've been doing this sort of thing in lettuce for, for a number of years. Um, but not, not with uh, the row crops and, and herbicides like this. Uh, and so now we're shifting and built, we've built a couple of machines. We've built 10 machines this year to go out in the fields and demonstrate for this for the customers. And so the machines that you just saw up there um, are the ones running uh, in, from Georgia to Texas uh, in the US. Um, I mentioned this earlier, I wanna come back to it, uh, is this notion of a rear spray detection. So we've got this thing that's detecting whether the plants are there, uh, but how do we know that we actually did the right thing? And you can make the assumption, yeah, the system was set up to do the right thing, it's gonna do it, do it correctly. But the reality is things change. The parameters of your system change. You're, if you're using odometry, your wheels can get muddy and they suddenly have different dynamics. Uh, your solenoid characteristics, when you're driving a solenoid, the, the dynamics of that change. And when you're moving at these speeds, you're talking about just a few millisecond change can be the difference between killing all the weeds and killing all your crop. And Trust me, we've killed crop before and that's not a happy experience. <laughs> you don't want to have that conversation with the farmer. 
So, um, <laughs> kind of a walk of shame when you're walking down the field with a farmer. Uh, yeah. um, and so, what that evolved into was, was the system that we developed, and there's lots of ways to go about this, but I really have, have just been struck by how valuable it's been to have a secondary camera that is evaluating the scene. Uh, in this case, it's an example you can see on the top is kind of an image uh, from the rear camera showing the sprays and everything. And on the bottom, you can see kind of these white blocks are showing where the images were actually detected. Uh, and what's nice is, 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 again, a deep learning system that's doing this, um, doing more pixel-wise segmentation in this case. Um, but you can see it, we actually are able to train it to pick up sprays that are really hard to detect that are on the plants themselves. And you can then start to understand, hey, did I get the spray right? Uh, if I'm having problems that are killing a lot of plants, I can flag the farmer to say, hey, stop working. Just, you know, the system's not working. You need to get it fixed, get it checked out. But most of the time what we can do is actually do self-calibration. So we're able to do online estimation of kind of the parameters of the system and just retrain the system effectively, kind of keep it in the, in the good sweet spot uh, so that it's doing the right thing all the time. So it's been this really nice balance. And again, it, it, it's what I think has made the difference in us being able to commercialize these systems is to go to scale, you have to not only be doing the action and doing the right thing most of the time, but you have to make sure that you're doing it all the time. And uh, I remember, uh, this is, I'm trying to remember how many years ago, it was probably five years ago, hearing a talk by Raph D'Andrea uh, from Kiva Systems, uh, and I, I was really struck by one of the things he mentioned was this idea that the robots they have that move around the Amazon warehouses are always self-calibrating, recalibrating, right? So you don't take it for granted that I took the system, I calibrated it the first time, and it's gonna go out and work for the next two years. You have to be continually measuring and monitoring the performance, especially when you're trying to do this kind of scale. Um, and I think that it's just been a powerful message that I try and keep, uh, keep reminding myself of. Um, and this is kind of the, the, the framework, the mental framework that we use in thinking about the system. It's, I don't claim this is anything novel, but I just want to kind of throw it out there. Um, we essentially started with pretty classical, right? It, it's a deliberative uh, planning type paradigm. You know, sense, plan, act would be the normal description of it. Um, we don't do a lot of planning in this case, but since decide act is what we called it. Uh, but adding into it this component that, that we call verify and learn. So the idea of using this system that can actually verify what's going on uh, from the actions that you've taken and then learning and adapting based on that. And that, that I think is really a, a powerful, valuable piece to take away from this type of system. Um, I thought I'd just mention some of the challenges that we're still tackling. Uh, I'd say there are four key areas that, that we focus on, um, trying to get things to move faster. Uh, it's always a challenge. The, the farmers want things to be faster and wider. Right? That's their standard go-to. Um, but they, there's a certain speed and width that just is, if you don't get to that point, it's not acceptable. If you can't match how fast they're doing and through, going through and doing planting, you're now breaking the kind of all their models for, for labor, for time in the field. Um, and so we have to kind of match those pieces. Um, so we're able to run roughly at, at the widths and speeds of the planter right now. Uh, that means kind of getting down to 25 millisecond per image processing. Uh, again, running a deep network on a Jetson. That's been really a, a great platform for doing that. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the speed in a second. Um, we've also obviously focused a lot on, on accuracy and you know, kind of precision recall type numbers uh, of being able to correctly detect weeds and crop. Um, the crop is pretty, I won't, I won't say easy, but the crop generally looks about the same. You can get lots of data on it. Um, the weeds are always more of a challenge. Uh, they, they come in lots of different shapes and sizes. They vary by region. Um, so we continue to make progress on that, but uh, it's always a challenge. Um, I'll also mention real briefly, but you know, we, we would like to remove the shrouds. I think that's always gonna be our goal. Um, it's some challenges, not only from the from computer vision side and lighting, but also from the blocking out the wind and, and what we have to deal with there. So we will continue to work on that and we'll report back that on that in a year or two, I hope. Uh, and then last one that I want to hammer on is um, something that, that I think we're sometimes frustrated in, especially the kind of deep learning community and the computer vision community of um, you see these tools and they work great on this data set. And you know, people are very careful about breaking out a, a test data set from the training data set. Okay, that's great. But what we found, that's not the challenge. If, if I go into a field and I collect data in that field, and broken new test and training data set, I can get high 90s in accuracy. So that's, that's not our challenge, and this is us in particular. Um, the challenge comes when I start to do the second field and the third field and the hundredth field. 
Uh, so how do these systems generalize? How do they transform not just from a particular field and particular situation, but to kind of those, call them unknown fields. I mean, that's a, it's a little bit hard to ask you to solve an unknown problem, but it's effectively that, right? I need to know how the system is gonna work in the guy's field that I've never visited before in Iowa, and uh, it needs to work reliably, or at least detect that it's going to not work reliably. So that's, that's another challenge within that. Um, so we have a pretty big focus on kind of these holdout tests and, and generalizability for these types of networks. Um, and I'd say the, the tools aren't really there yet. Um, they're continuing to improve, but it's, it's an area of focus for us. Um, I like this curve just because uh, it's been a lot of hard work and this is kind of demonstrates that we've made progress. Um, on the, the white curve has the axis right here, which is the cycle time, how long it takes to process an image. And so you can see when out of the box, some of the networks we started with were up in the 600 millisecond range. Um, today we're down in the 25 millisecond range, so we're kind of out here. Um, the blue curve is our accuracy, so kind of detection rates, which again, we started just out of the box at around 45%, and nowadays we're up in the high 90s. So there's been great progress on there. It's, it's, that's always fun to have that progress. And, um, excuse me. and uh, one of the things that's been interesting is that, uh, you know, I typically have always think about progress we get through uh, Moore's Law. And I think, I can't remember, Rod Brooks, somebody, somebody talked about this the other day, of like, yeah, you just wait on Moore's Law and, and your system gets faster. Uh, all of this progress, or I should say, none of this progress has been a hardware change. So this is all in software. Um, and it, a lot of credit to NVIDIA, who's been just pushing and pushing the software, as well as, you know, we've done some work internally to push the software, but, um, there's, there's really been an amazing amount of progress in the software side of, of these deep networks and, and the su support that comes to them. Um, so coming back to this notion of, of verification and learning, I think there's just a few things I wanted to call out uh, before I start to wrap up. But uh, the, um, the system is, is one that you know, we we'll, we'll used to do the operation that we do. One of, the, one of the reasons we chose to spray is because there are lots of operations in the field that, that can be used, uh, use sprayers. Uh, so there's herbicide, which is what we're doing for, for weeding, but it's applying fertilizer, it's applying fungicides, it's applying insecticides. Uh, you can apply specific nutrients that uh, will help grow the plant and have plants catch up to each other so you've got even growth rates. Uh, so there's a lot of cool things you can do by spraying different chemicals at different times. And again, our goal is to not spray them everywhere. Don't spray bare ground if you don't need to. Spray them just on the plants that you need them. Um, the second thing that, that comes up here is the ability to run these micro experiments. So the ability to go through and vary the rates just subtly over the field and explore the space, right? So it's kind of this online parameter optimization where you can really change things on the fly and understand what the impact is. Now that requires a measurement. Uh, so so the, the experiments you can run no problem, that's easy. Um, but we've been developing systems to also measure that and give you feedback so you can understand the impacts of, again, just small changes in the system that allow you to, to optimize the system. And we do that with, with a drone system. We also, uh, because spraying is a multi-step operation, we'll spray some crops uh, are just two or three times, some crops five or six times. They'll go through and have multiple operations. So we're able to go and collect data from each of these experiments every time we go through the field. Uh, and so that's kind of a really nice way to start tying together this kind of long range experiment. And another goal for us is to, to extend out to different operations. And one of the reasons I wanted to show this is, is just to convey this idea that there's just a ton of these really interesting problems in agriculture uh, that just haven't been worked on at all. Um, so you can imagine the same kind of um, you know, sense, decide, act type paradigm, the same type of verification and learn paradigm being applied to all the operations in agriculture from tillage and, and preparing the soil to, to planting to fertilizing all the way through the harvest. And our goal is to not have harvest look like that. That's an actual example. That is four plants that were lined up right next to each other. And this is what, excuse me, this is what you see all the time in agriculture. But you get completely different yields from the plants. <coughs> and so what we'd like to do is optimize the, the, the plant care so that these things all look the same. You get the same yield out. <coughs> um, so one of the things that people always ask me about is, hey, are you gonna start working on autonomous tractors? <laughs> like, uh, you know, it's such a big popular area right now. And there's been some really cool work already done on it. Uh, in, the, in the research community, I'd say also in the, um, 
John Deere has done some work over the last 20, 30 years, actually, in, in autonomous systems. Um, one of the things that I've been struck by, and, and yes, I think John Deere is interested in working on it, and all, all of the different manufacturers are working on this. Um, but one of the things I've been really struck by is it's not enough to just get a driverless or autonomous tractor, right? What, what farmers are doing is they're not driving tractors. It's not like us driving a car where we're trying to get from point A to point B. They're doing operations. They're, they're doing something like planting and tilling and, and harvesting and everything. And so, yes, there are some beautiful challenges there in terms of how do you automate that, how do you detect obstacles, all of those. There's some easier parts as well, right? They've got GPS. So the, you know, the slam problem really probably isn't necessary in agriculture. So there are lots of ways it's different, but I think there's some really cool problems in autonomy. But the thing I would emphasize is <coughs> you have to remember that you can't have autonomy without these other oper operations being automated. Uh, and that's a really, just a different way of thinking that I, I really hadn't considered until I started working with John Deere, um, is this notion that you know if I have an autonomous system and it can't successfully and reliably till the, till the soil or plant the seeds, it's of no value. It's not gonna take a person out of the tractor, which is really the goal of autonomy. Uh, so I think I just wanna kind of call that out that there's kind of this very interesting and important notion that we don't want to lose in thinking about autonomous systems for agriculture is that these things also have to operate on specific tasks. Um, and <coughs> so when I think about it, it's kind of the same notion. Now we can extend, extend this notion of feedback in, into lots of scales. And I think it's just, again, trying to emphasize this notion. There's some really cool problems in agriculture and, and robotics applied to agriculture. And, um, the robotics, the, the actuation part may be relatively simple, but it's this whole system integration of sensing and actuation that makes it a really interesting and compelling problem. Um, so I've just taken three sample applications here. Um, I, I kind of like I indicated, you, you can use that same kind of paradigm for how you, how you make these things robust and scalable. Um, you can use this notion of feeding back information, right? So um, when I go through and spray a herbicide, I can tell you how my planter did feed that information back to tune it. I can run these micro experiments, so I get all of this information that can flow. Um, and same thing with harvest. Harvest is kind of the great decider of like, how did I do over the whole season? And I can incrementally feed that back throughout my system. And then there's this other time scale we operate, which is kind of a multi-year time scale, right? Every time I get a harvest, it tells me everything that happened, and I can start to accumulate this data, integrate this data over years, even. Um, so I think there's this really nice opportunity to, for data analysis and, and um, kind of learning and, and validation of, of the systems. All right, that takes me to the end. <laughs> so, thank you. I will just call out. So this is the, this is the most recent machine we had. That's around a 10 meter wide machine that'll do 12 rows of, of cotton and soybeans. Um, that weighs way too much. I don't even want to get into the weight. But <laughs> Thank you very, mu <coughs> very much, Jim, for uh, the nice presentation. Uh, it's great that you use, in this way, you can use less chemicals. Of course, mm -hmm. the goal, of, of hopefully, would be to not use chemical at all. Mm -hmm. Is there a way, are you thinking, is it stupid to, to try to do a mechanical of the instruction? Yeah, or no, the killing? Uh, right, right. Uh, no, it's a great question. I get asked it all the time. Um, no, I think, I think it makes a lot of sense, and I think it's important to explore that. I think if you want to think about having an impact in the scale that we've been targeting of, of broadly impacting farms out there, there's just challenges with mechanical actuation. So uh, it tends to be limited to pretty low speeds. So you, most systems that I'm aware of today and that, that we've looked at, you can't get above probably, um, I don't know, four or five kilometers an hour. Uh, and again, it just doesn't match the speeds at which these, the farms have to operate. Um, so. Uh, so be careful if you make that autonomous and it can work 24 hours a day and can get into fields when it's wet and muddy, you can change the game. So you know, that's why I, I don't want to say no, but for us going through that scale, it, it just didn't make sense. Uh, there's, there's also challenges. If you don't fully pull a weed out, it'll grow back. A, a lot of weeds will grow back, not all of them, but uh, it's also difficult just to eliminate, eliminate them fully mechanically. And we looked at mechanical fire, uh, we had Tesla coils that were electrocuting plants. I mean, we, we went through some crazy stuff. Uh, and all of them either required too much energy density or too much time to actuate uh, to get them to work. Um, so we focused on, on spraying, which is, 
it's kind of like you, the thing that you're gonna, that's gonna take your action, you get to drop behind and leave. You don't have to exert all that energy and effort at the moment. And, um, and then, as I mentioned, spraying is, is used across the, the entire agriculture process, right? So as soon as that, actually while you're planting, you're often spraying chemicals all the way through right up to, to when you um, harvest, there's generally five, 10, 15 operations that involve spraying throughout that process. So if you solve one, you've kind of solved the, this whole broad range that goes beyond just the mechanical. But it's a great point. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for the nice presentation. I was just uh, wondering, so here we, we agree that the goal is to just try to tackle the problem of food volume that we'll need in the future mm -hmm. for the next generation. And I was wondering uh, here, so you, you show that at the end, okay, we, we if, uh, involve more uh, pesticides uh, faster, stronger mm -hmm. to kill all these resistant plants. Mm -hmm. But I have the feeling that I missed a bit uh, at the end, like, if you want to actually eat healthy, you will go to a nutritionist or you will go on a diet. So basically, that's the quality of your food that matters at some point and not the quantity. So my yeah. question is, uh, did you make some study to actually show that the quality that you have at the end is still the same to just show that you don't need more, but you just have the same quality at the end? Yeah, that will uh, no. Actually suit people. We haven't, we haven't done that study. Um, I. I don't really worry too much about that because I think we're, we're essentially just eliminating the amount of chemicals that are being used, uh, or reducing the amount of chemicals, not eliminating, but uh, reducing the amount of chemicals being used. Um, I think food quality, we're not gonna make the qu food quality better, but I don't think we're gonna make, make it any worse. And again, maybe the goal goes back to, can you expand the amount of food that's produced? Uh, and one way we're targeting that is by eliminating the weeds because that limits your yield. Uh, the other is, again, kind of as you apply other other types of uh, inputs, um, and, and it can be things like biologicals that help help nourish the plant and, and feed particular parts of the plant. Um, you can start to make the plants grow more evenly. That gives you gives you more uniform yield, so it, it makes it you can harvest it kind of at its, at its optimal point. Okay, thank you, because I know that, for example, the glyphosate is quite <laughs> controversial. In fact, we can talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 